Hello there, everyone. Just a very quick reminder before we dive into a really fun interview with legendary park player Tom Murphy. At the beginning of last week's episode, a follow-up interview with adult improvers Andrea Shivda and Stacia Pugh, I announced the Perpetual Chess Happy Hour, which will be weekly adult chess classes starting in October. I'm happy to report strong interest already. If you submitted your email address, you'll be hearing from me in a couple weeks. If you haven't yet or you want more information, please go to perpetualchesspod.com slash happy hour. The link to it will be in the show description, and you can find out all the information you need there or in last week's episode. As for this week's, I'm super excited to bring you this interview with Tom Murphy. He's got some great stories, and I'm, I'm glad to finally be bringing the park player's perspective here to Perpetual Chess. Great life experience from Tom. So sit back and enjoy, and I hope you guys all are well. Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. I am super excited for our guest this week. He is a USCF master, but I mean, USCF expert was master strength when I used to try to tangle with him in the 1990s. He's held court at the chess clubs, parks, and yes, McDonald's of Philadelphia, D.C., and Chicago. He's been written about in the Philadelphia Inquirer, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, uh, NPR Radio, chessbase.com, many more places. And in the cities that he has lived, he is a legend of the Blitz Chess streets. So I am super excited to hear his story and get some some Blitz and chess and life reflection from. So let's bring him in. Tom Murphy, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well in yourself. I'm well, thank you. Yeah, and for listeners, we're doing this old school. I'm calling from Skype to Tom's phone, but I think the audio is decent, so I hope you guys will hang in there. I think it'll be well worth it when we get to hear Tom's story. Um, So, Tom, I've been, of course, I've, you know, I know that you don't remember me as well as I remember you, being the legend that you are and being that I was just a little, I was just a teenager when we used to play. But, of course, I've been even since I left Philly and you left Philly, I've been tracking you. And when your name pops up in articles, I've read read them. So I know a little bit about how you got into chess and what's been going on. But for our listeners, could you maybe begin by telling them what was going on in your life when you were introduced to this uh, wonderful and addictive game? Well, it certainly is wonderful and it is definitely addictive. Uh, what happened, I picked up chess at my high school in Philadelphia. Uh, Your audience may not know it, but Central High School used to be one of the big chess powerhouses on the East Coast. Holler, my sister went there and I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Okay. And and so at the time that I was going to Central, it was an all-boys school. So that lets you, that dates it quite a bit. (laughs) Right. So anyhow, my math teacher got me started. And were you hooked right away? Well, I got hooked when we actually took a trip to New York for the Scholastic Nationals. That, that'll do it. Uh, um, and were you like studying right from then or did you have a break? Um, oh, no, 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 dude. Me and studying chess were not the best of friends. What happened was uh, the Nationals was such a big event, and I played so poorly, I felt like I let the team down. So that kind of started the impetus. Okay, and then what? Well, I went to the military. Uh, We played chess casually there. And then I came back to Philadelphia, I guess, around 1980. And strangely enough, as fate would have it, I ran into Professor Brian Height, a history teacher, who wanted to teach me the history of the French Revolution while he took 200 bucks playing Blitz with me. <laughs> this is not the French defense revolution. True story. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
and, uh, what was funny is uh, a a senior master, Norman Rogers, was sitting there playing him when I wandered into this mess. And he smiled, he watched, and he presented me with my actual first chess book after I paid off my 200. That's nice. What book did Pete give you? Uh, chess Opening Theory by Alexi Swayton. Okay. And and how was that book? When when you dug in, were you were you hooked, or were you like, "This is uh, this is boring"? No, 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 no. After a two hundred dollar investment, I was determined to go back the following year and shut that loud mouth up. <laughs> Didn't <laughs> happen. <laughs> it did not happen that way. Uh-huh. But it kept me reading for a whole year. Okay, and so what's happening with your chest strength at this time? So what you're, you were what we now call an adult improver, already out of high school, done with the military. Oh, yeah. I was a proud 895 player, and wow. I thought I knew everything. That, man, you came a long way, Tom. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, it, fate was very kind. Uh, what happened was... Norman Rogers was part of the mate by force chess team. And they adapted me as their chess mascot. So I got a well-rounded chess education from three masters, two experts, and a bunch of A players. So they would look at your games or would they give you books, give you puzzles, all of the above? What was their approach to, to all of the above? Uh, my best friend, um, uh, uh, William Page. Mm-hmm. Uh, pa- Page was about twenty three fifty, a bookworm like me, and he would invite me down there on the south side of Philadelphia to study. Now, I mean, he would pull out in formats the whole nine yards, and he would walk me through the theory. I don't know how. Well, one of the things the guys like that I always have fighting spirit. I just didn't have the information to fight with. <laughs> so they, they, the whole team took a hand in educating a young man. That's excellent. Uh, pa- pass the information down. Um, yeah, and, and rest in peace to Paige. These guys are Philly legends that, uh, that Mr. Murphy here is naming, by the way. Um, so when did you feel like you were starting to get traction in your game, or was it just like a very slow and steady climb? You know what? A few years later, uh, the World Open had a singular blitz tournament. Singular in the fact that there were 50 GMs, I don't know how many IMs, playing in this one spectacular blitz tournament that has never happened since. And I met the luminaries that Mr. Page was introducing me to in Informat including the one individual who motivated me probably more than any other chess player alive. So imagine this. So I'm a young man. I, I, I show up at the board, and my opponent is the illustrious international master, uh, uh, Anthony Sadie, a uh, columnist for the uh, Los Angeles Times. And he walks up to the board. He says, young man, you sure you want to go through with this? <laughs> and yeah that's exactly what he did that was my reaction one of the guys from mate by force was playing uh yasser Serwan on the board next to me and his only he gave me the high sign kick this guy's butt uh needless to say i fortunately got lucky and won one of the two games and he never said anything disrespectful again wow that's a crazy- i knew that i was hooked that's a, an amazing story. Dr. Sadie, of course, a legend of the game. He's um, written some great books. He's probably best known for being the guy that got Fisher on the plane for the 1972 match of the century. Um, so, yeah, a bit unfortunate that he underestimated you. Tom, um, you're, you're an African-American gentleman. Did you feel that there were like racial overtones or just general stereotyping? Or do you just think it was kind of an innocent comment? Or how did you interpret um, Dr. Sadie's, uh, I interpreted him the way I interpret all most people who make comments like that. 
a man has that has never played me. And I made sure that I gave him a memorable game. Now, mind you, he was not the only one. Along the way in that same tournament, I met and played uh, Robert Byrne, another Fisherite. Yeah, another legend. Oh, yeah. So Grandmaster Byrne played a line that I had just finished studying, and I lucked up in one, one out of two with him. Now I'm thinking like I'm God's gift to chess. <laughs> I don't know why I got that idiot idea, but I did. <laughs> and you're what? You're in your 20s or around 30? How old were you? I'm in my 20s. Okay. I'm in my 20s. And I guess over the next 20 years, I played at every single World Open, hoping to repeat that glory. Of course, it didn't happen, but it yeah. kept me coming back. And you would play in the actual tournament because I, you know, the Skittles room at the World Open is always um, jumping off too. At least it was back when I used to go every year. But you were playing the the big tournament or just going and looking for customers. I would uh, play customers? the big tournament, and then I would go find me some customers. Okay, and of course, by customers we mean Tom has been known. Of course, he's he's made his livelihood playing blitz blitz for money. Um, always a tough customer. Definitely, as I said, got the best of me as as a teenager. Um, Tom, I, one thing I'm curious about, because as I was thinking about introducing you and I was uh, reading reading stuff online, I read a nice article by Daim Shabazz of Chess, of uh, Chess Drum, um, and he okay. was talking about the, the term hustler. Like, do you consider that a sort of pejorative term if someone were to call you a chess hustler? I mean, because you didn't you were honorable when we played, you know, you're not. You're not trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. You just beat them. So what do you think of that term? Well, let's, 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 let me rephrase it this way. To the people who for decades have contributed to the Murphy Foundation, <laughs> some call me a hustler. Others call me a entertainer. But most of them call me a wonderful blitz player who they would dearly love to beat once in a while. So, so I don't hustle. I right, look. I don't know if you ever watched the movie The Color of Money. Oh yeah, classic pool hus pool hustling movie. Come on now. So okay, it is hustling. It's hustling at say the World Open. I'll give you an example. 1985, I'm, I guess I'm about an A player. And me and one of my partners, we made $3,000 in the Skittles room. Wow. That particular year, I was definitely a chess hustler. Because I would talk crap and get people to give me odds that I knew they couldn't give. And I was, I was like, oh, I love you dearly. Thank you for your contribution. And, and I would tease them, but I wouldn't hurt anyone's feelings. So most of the people I played at the World Open, I would play them again year after year after year after year. See, uh, so, so the concept of the hustler is a one-time hit and quit. The, t the concept of the chess entertainer is someone every other chess player wants to either emulate or beat. And, and they volunteer. It's not, it's not a hustle. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'll tell you my distinction. There, there's two distinctions I would make when I think of a hustler. Number one is if it's someone who misrepresents their skill level um, in order to get okay. to get someone to play for more. And number two is like the dirty tricks. Now, as far as I'm concerned, trash talk, that's fair game. But you know, All if right. you're doing stuff like pushing the clock away, or of course, there's this famous uh, Maurice Ashley video that he shot with Tim Ferriss, where he went to, um, I believe it was Washington Square Park or Union Square. Yes. Um, and the guy yes. was, uh, the guy like made some illegal move. Um, that's what I would describe as hustling. Whereas if you're just gambling to me, that's, that's, you know, that's we're consenting adults, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I knew you would understand. Okay. Glad to hear it. And I have a related question. So, Tom, the way this show works is people who um, people who help support the show, um, who donate a bit of money to keep it going, are able to submit questions for the guests. So I have a couple for you. And this one is from a gentleman, Come on. a, a gentleman named Bruce Scott, who asks, how does trash talking? How does trash talking enter into your winning technique? 
Well, over the years, my trash talk has gone from R-rated to PG. <laughs> and, and so, for me, trash talking might be, I'm launching the termites. Now, mind you, termites refers to a piece or a pawn that has invaded enemy territory and is about to start all kinds of trouble. <laughs> so I'll tell my opponents, hey, man, you got a termite in the house. You need an exterminator back. <laughs> I like it. You feel me? Yeah, Very that's PG. Good. Yeah. The guys here in Chicago absolutely love it. Now, I got to tell you that when it comes to trash talking and signifying, the Chicago chess players have gotten so good, they did a video that won an award. And if you will do yourself a favor, you need to look up the video called The Sideline Grandmaster. Five Line Grandmaster. It explains, okay. The Sideline Grandmaster explains trash talk, hustling, everything all in one shot. Okay, and was this done Beautiful by Beautiful little video. Done by Nathan Kelly? No, it is uh, it is done by another gentleman whose name I is not on my I can't call him right now. Okay. But Nathan but, Kelly knows the individual. Okay, but I do want to give a shout out to Nathan Kelly of the National Blitz League for putting us in touch. This is an amazing interview already, Tom. So um but let oh, whoa, 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 whoa. let me give you some background on what started the 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 chess uh, the National Blitz League. Okay. All right. So, approximately two and a half years ago, uh, the guys in Chicago decided that since we don't have an an established blitz club, we needed one. We needed a a a standardized chess club because in Chicago we've got players. Chicago, I guess you could say, is 20 square miles, we got a thousand chess players, and we got 50 different pockets of chess. So the National Blitz League was a brainchild of Nathan and I to bring the Chicago chess community together. And it started out with just 15 guys that uh, invested in the chess club. And we named ourselves the Chicago Blitzers, and we started playing other cities. Uh, as fate would have it, uh, those other cities uh, became victims. But more importantly, every credible chess player in Chicago now wants to be a Blitzer. So I, I think that the National Blitz League is a beautiful unifying force. Yeah, it really sure. builds a sense of community. And pre-COVID, it you know th it was actual like field trips to the other city to play. So yes, sir. So oh, I mean, yes, when people are making that kind of trip, you know, uh, people taking breaks from their jobs or school or whatever it may be to go to another city, play these people. Obviously, there's going to be trash talk involved. There's going to be preparation involved. So, um, so yeah, it's a it's a great endeavor, and I commend commend you and Nathan both. Um, and you guys have some some monsters in that league as well. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, we do. We've got Chicago is very chess talented. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't all continue to work as a cohesive unit. You know, it was my vision that, you know, the, the National Blitz League would be the, the, the touchstone that would lead to generating some grandmasters here in the Chicago area. And uh, we've got a couple that, that have the potential, like Daniel Jones uh, and, and um, George Lee. So we've, we've got a couple of superstars that are definitely on the rise. Okay, so, and someone like that, I mean, Daniel Jones, I, I, I believe his name came up when I interviewed Rochelle Ballantyne, um, you know, su successful businessman. I believe he's a dad as well and recently made USCF master. What, um, what that is advice, correct. What advice do you give someone like that who's looking to push even higher in chess and what, you know, I'm sure I know that, that 
in addition to just playing blitz with people, you give some lessons. So what is it, what in your mind, Tom, is the best sort of bang for your buck uh, way to get better at chess? For me, there are a couple of words uh, that are actually biblical in, in nature. The first one is patience. Because chess patience has to do with your tactical decision making. The second one is perseverance, which has to do with your willingness to do the right thing for the right reason, expecting the right outcome. And the third one is being able to stay peaceful in your mind in the midst of the calculating storm that is tournament chess. Not to mention blitz chess, right? Absolutely. So when I talk about my three P's to the chess players here in Chicago, uh, the patience piece is the one that draws the dumb look most of the time until they actually apply it. And then all of a sudden they're like, Tom, I'm not patient at all, but I appreciate it. <laughs> That's the fourth P. Appreciate it. Um, no, oh, can, yeah. Can you remind me the three? <laughs> can you remind me the three P's? Patience, patience, perseverance, and peace of mind. Okay, I like it. Patience, perseverance, and peace of mind. All of those are necessary to be a successful tournament player. Okay, and I can. I don't know what your how your game has evolved since since I used to play you, Tom. But one thing I'll say is people might have the impression that that since since you're you're kind of you're a park player or whatever that that you might be like all tactics and tricks but for me it was the opposite i liked i was more of a dynamic player when i was a kid and even though at some you know at some points our ratings were around the same you you were just positionally solid and i just couldn't crack you you really waited for your moments and that's why you got the better of me is that still your like your overall playing style Oh, absolutely. As, absolutely. Look, now, before you get to your next question, I know you've been in touch with Greg Shad, right? Yes, I have. Yeah, one of my best friends. All right. Well, as Greg would, would validate, I used to teach him and Jennifer when they were 14 and 13. And they would get mad at me. I would give them five to one. And I would just quietly talk to them while playing them about the three Ps. Well, as it turns out, both Greg and Jennifer applied those lessons very well. They sure did. So, Tom, I want to get to some more stories. But first, we're going to uh, to take a break and, and hear from our sponsor, Chessable.com. As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its move trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlson and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin, Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. So Tom, it's been great improvement advice, um, and I might want to circle back to it later, but I also want to get some more some more stories. Uh, the story you mentioned about making $3,000 in a weekend at the World Open, that's a fun one because I think our listeners don't have a lot of stories like that. So uh, one question for you is, uh, who is your best customer of all time? You don't have to say their name if you don't want, but if just like how much money you think some like the 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 biggest quote unquote. My best whale, customer? Yeah. Oh, I have a several customers that are well over the $5,000 mark. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. And what are your interactions like? Do they just do they just know they're going to lose or do they is it like they All right, okay. I, I, let me give you an example. One of my best friends, he also happens to teach chess in Chicago, and he is financially probably what the most successful chess teacher that I know outside of Sunil Wiramenchi. And every time, every single chance he gets, the first thing out of his mouth is, 
Uh, Tom, he'll call me or we'll text. We'll meet at a Starbucks. All right, Tom, I need to get some practice. I'm getting rusty. <laughs> That's his sign that he's ready to donate another 100 or two to get his <laughs> chess lesson in. And he's 2,300 strength. Excellent. And so, and are you just, like, what percentage of the games would you say you're winning? Is it in these matches? Oh, uh, just 60 60- Sixty, yeah. maybe seventy percent. Yeah, that's probably what keeps them coming back. If you just won every game, you know. Um, it, oh it might no, 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 no! Uh, that the, the dream of being the unbeatable player left decades ago. <laughs> what I do is I have a joy for the game that kind of resonates with everybody I meet, and it's infectious. So my buddy, uh, I don't know if he wants me to give this shout out, but. Nah, I won't. I'll yeah. keep him quiet. Better say, better say. But he is sorry. a well-known chess teacher all over the country. His kids go to the nationals. And, and speaking of stories, here's a story I want to relate because it meant the most to me as both a chess player and a chess teacher. Uh, last year, uh, I was connected with three young ladies, uh, three seventh graders. And with my work, they went to Peoria and won the state title for an African-American team, African-American girls team that had never happened before in Illinois. And I was very, very proud of playing a role in helping St. Atherita get on the map. Excellent. That's, that's really cool to hear. Do you enjoy working with uh, the younger generation? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. See, see, adults have pretty much set their mind in the path that they want to think. Young people, they come with a million and one questions because they're trying to improve the way they think. And so when I get young people who really want to learn, that's a joy for me. Cool. Um, another question, Tom. Who is the strongest player you've ever played in Blitz? Dang. Now you're, that's a toss-up. I'm going to say that it's a three-way tie between Roman Zinjin Isvili, uh, Mitkoff, and Ben Feingold. All right. Shout out to Feingold. Yeah, I figured Jinji might be might finger figure into the conversation because I certainly remember in the World Open Skittles room some some uh Yes some, sir. Oh yes, battles. sir. I have never seen anyone give five to one on the money, five to one on the clock, and mate on the square his opponent picks and he still wins. Absolute legend, yeah. <laughs> Amazing stuff. So that's 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 a hustle I will never get over because he did it to Norman Rogers and beat him up pretty good, and that was my coach. Yeah, yeah, he's pizza. Pete, I call him Pete because he's also known as Pete. By the way, um, he's mm-hmm. he's a strong player, so that that's just just amazing stuff. Um, Tell me about it. So, Tom, I mean, so I've, as I said earlier, I've sort of kept track of your whereabouts, even though um, I haven't seen you for whatever it's been. <laughs> oh, man, we're getting old. It's been close to probably 25 years. 25 so, years, yeah. So what what brought you from, from Philly to D.C. and then ultimately from D.C. to Chicago? Well, my sister lived in D.C. and I got a really good job working on Capitol Hill for a decade. So this was, uh, was this so when you that were allowed me an environmental fundraiser? Yeah, well, yes, yes. Okay. So, so I spent a decade there and, and, and that was very cool. And Chicago then Chicago is another story. <laughs> Chicago was my ex-wife was from Chicago. And she led me along, had me come out here, and then she dissed me. So <laughs> but you I liked said, it well, there. I like it here. Cool. Right up until COVID. I don't like COVID so much. Yeah. How are you holding up? So, like, I mean, it's got to affect your ability to play Blitz, or at least I'm sure it did initially. So how did you? how have you been adjusting? Well, the good news was that the National Blitz League was doing online arenas. 
So that gave me some opponents to play. And I guess right around May of this year, uh, one of our Starbucks allowed us to play chess on the outside. Okay. So that allowed me and a few other players to get together sporadically. Okay, and then Nate also Nathan Kelly also sent me a video that apparently that you guys play at McDonald's a fair amount. Uh, we did until McDonald's had to close for COVID. Okay, and Tom, do you think that that the the tradition of park chess is dying? I mean, people worry about chess clubs dying because of the, of course, online boom. But park chess, I mean, that's got its own stories and subculture and special place. All right, okay, chess I'm glad you brought that up. So here in Chicago, we have an area called Hyde Park, very prestigious area. Uh, President Obama lives near there. And we've got a chess park that yesterday was practically full. Awesome. Oh, yes. The trash talk was going. (laughs) And one of my chess students was playing his arch nemesis. Now, I don't know if you follow the National Blitz League's uh, cage matches. I follow them on Facebook, so I, I generally see when they're happening. I don't, I don't get to tune in that often, but I'm generally aware of what's going on. All right. So anyhow, uh, two gentlemen who participated in one of the recent cage matches, uh, my, my student, Henry Getz, and the minister, Steve Jennings, they had a, blo- a battle royale yesterday. So we had like 20 people standing around watching. That's pretty nice. good for park chess. Yeah, that is. And do there, are the people on the sidelines commenting too, or is it you have to be quiet while they're playing? Oh, dude, we're talking about park chess. This is not okay. a chess club. I thought Everybody I knew the and their mama has something to say. Somebody's either a fish or a genius, depending on who's betting on who. Uh-huh. And so it, it was a, a glorious event. Um. Excellent. Now, Tom, in these articles in the media that I've mentioned, it, it's been it's been written that you you've been homeless at times. I believe um, you you're you've been an addict at times. You've been in in jail at times. So, or at once, I believe. Um, so, I hope you don't mind my asking. But like, how has your life progressed? Um, are you are are you how are your demons? Uh, well, treating God you has been extremely good. Extremely good. Things have things have solidified. Uh, I get a Regular check from Uncle Sam called Social Security, and I make a few hundred a, a, a week teaching. Okay, and uh, you, stable place to live and stuff like that. I'm called. We're talking from my apartment. I'm looking out at, at uh, Interstate 94, which is right in front of my window. Uh, yes, sir. Things are pretty good. That's awesome to hear, Tom. I'm, that really makes me happy. Um, and. D- for anyone battling similar demons, like what advice would you give? What What's the way forward? The first thing is you got to find something you love other than that demon. For me, chess was that way up and out. Uh, I would also suggest that they talk to one of the anonymous fellowships, which I've been a part of for 20 years. Uh, awesome. I can't. I can't go into full detail because they're anonymous. Yeah, no, but that that's great to hear. And actually, we have another uh, listener Patreon mailbag question from Angus McLeod. Um, I had linked. You you've got a Wikipedia page, Tom. By the way, you're big time. Um, I sure do. So I had linked to your Wikipedia page, uh, and in addition to an article or two, so Angus McLeod writes in to, to say, he says, hey, Ben, I love the podcast, been listening for about three months. I'm a recovering addict myself and fairly new to chess, working my way up the rating ladder, currently just shy of 1,300. I would like to ask Tom, does he find chess cal- playing chess calming for the mind in terms of being present and in the moment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, uh The thing about a labor of love like chess is that you can have your moments where you're fully invested in it, and then you'll have moments when you can't stand the thought of looking at a chess book. And in every instance, chess will call you back 
and insist that you give it one more shot. <laughs> True now, words have now, never in been my spoken. Reflective, <laughs> so in my reflective moments, yes, I, it, it's a very common experience right up until I try it in the next tournament. <laughs> so are you still playing tournaments too? I am still playing tournaments. Excellent. Um, yeah, so like the rest of us, I'm sure you're eager for, for tournaments to resume in full force. I would love nothing better. And so, Tom, is it correct that it was it six months that you spent in jail, I believe I read in one of the articles? Something like that. D do you mind talking about what that experience was like? Were you able to get your hands on a couple chess books? Uh, the, the Washington, D.C. chess community sent me plenty of books. Okay. So and I, I, start, I started a, 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 a chess community while I was there, and some pretty good players were in there. Yeah, that's what everyone hears. I, re I mean, you know, the, the prison industrial complex is the topic of another podcast, but I mean, in addition yeah. to the fact that too many people are in jail, I wish that, that there was, you know, more free, free interchange of ideas between people outside of jail and people in jail. But, but you do always hear about how popular chess is in, in some prisons. All right, let me, let me just lay this little thought on you. Now, Malcolm X said something in the 1950s, and, and it, it always resonated with me. He said that if jails were to invest in books and the, the residents of the jails were to read those books and turn jails into universities, they would kick everybody and their mama out of jail. Yeah. That thought always resonated with me because for whatever reason that people go, if they can't find a resource while they're there, they've got time on their hands. And if they apply themselves while they have time on their hands, amazing things will happen. Uh, after my short stint, uh, my blitz rating rose to 2480. And I've been trying to chase that number ever since. Huh. Yeah. Funny how so COVID works. gave me an opportunity. I almost cracked 2400 on chess.com. And I said, well, COVID cannot be all bad because I ain't been that close to that number in a while. That's good to hear, Tom, because I was thinking about it. <clears throat> I saw that you had a chess.com account, but you have kind of a presence. I mean, we already talked about trash talking, but also just sort of like a, a, a kind of force over the board that, that made me think, thinking back to when I played you as a teenager, I wouldn't find it as, as intimidating to play you online. Do you, do you think you're a stronger over the board player? Everyone here in Chicago seems to say that. Yeah, I, I bet. I haven't gotten the results in tournaments that I would like, but my overall level of play has definitely improved. Okay. Um, and so speaking of, of the books you read in prison, the books that uh, Wilbur Page gave you back in the day, so what, what are your favorite chess books, Tom? Uh, new in chess. The magazine. I, keep, I have a little chess bag, and I keep a copy of a new in chess in there always. Yeah, just amazing. Always just, looking for a new wrinkle to apply uh, or, or strategy that, that suits my temperament. Yeah, just, just an incredible magazine and, you know, in a great way. If in this age of information overload, if you just read new in chess, you're going to, you're going to know the big stuff that's going on both in, uh, in openings and sort of at the top level in the battles. Absolutely. Uh, what about books? I'm Absolutely. sure you got some time. Mm -hmm. What about book recommendations? I feel like you're holding out. All on right. This. <laughs> All right. So for up and coming chess players, a, a necessary book, uh, I'll, I'll give a couple. One is in game strategy by Mikhail Sheroshevsky. Ooh, classic. I highly Good recommend stuff. that to everybody I teach. Yeah. Uh, the other one is, uh, the art of the middle game by, uh, Karez and Kotov. Excellent. And then I suggest my system for opening understanding. So you don't find my system to be a little bit boring? No, sir. All right. Purist. Because, no, sir. I have uh, 
two thirteen. I have uh, two fourteen year old twins and a thirteen year old sister. Uh, a family that I teach, and I'm walking them through uh, Nimzovich's theories. Now, the thirteen year old girl, she's she prefers in game theory, and that's where she outshines her brothers. The brothers like tactics and opening theory. That's where they outshine her. And each one is growing according to their temperament. Yeah, you got to uh, let... I was just going to say, you yeah, one of the pursue 14 what year right. olds uh, what beat his first master this year. And awesome. he is proudly bragging that he'll be a master by the time he graduates high school. And I believe he will. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Um, and for anyone interested in getting to- coaching from Tom, do you are you able to do online lessons too, Tom, or strictly uh, IRL as we call it? Well, I'm, I just bought a new laptop, so I'm gonna start fiddling around with Zoom until I get it right, and then I'll start teaching online. Okay. If you want me to to link to any information, you can let me know when we're done. But but I do have a, a couple more questions if you don't mind, Tom. Just come on. Okay, so what about yourself? You're still trying to get back to 2400 chess.com blitz rating. Um, you like new in chess. Is there anything else you're doing to work on your own game? Well, strangely enough, the more I teach, the more I learn. Because I always investigate the topics I'm going to bring up. And, and then I'll find some new stuff. For example... I just started rereading uh, 500 Master Games of Chess by Tartakara and Dumont. Yeah, and his section, his section on romantic chess is waking up some of my tactical thought processes. Excellent. Yeah, so that's that book, been a help this year. Yeah, that book's a classic. Is it? You just you still have the um, the descriptive notation version, the big thick. I, yes, I do. Yeah, yes, that I was do. the one I grew up with. I wonder if it's an algebraic. Um, oh yeah, but, they have an algebraic copy, but I like the descriptive, and I like the language that they use in analyzing the games. Could you give an example? Uh, I mean, not you hold know, not, on, not word for word. Second. Okay, all right. You're reaching uh, for the uh, book for here. example, uh, for example, they use. There was a game from the 1800s in the Queen's Gambit accepted. And when he, when the writer described the queen fact that takes place, the flowing language and the commentary leading up to the sack and the fact that the sack was so positionally sound, it's the kind of story that I translate to other people. So my, all of my younger students, they all get a chance to try to outwit the GM that played that game. And for whatever reason, kids particularly are fascinated with sacking the queen because that's the piece they least want to give up. But my students tend to take the side, well, we'll take the the other material and we're going to beat you with the queen. I love that challenge. Yeah, kids kids do like their queens. Um, so, and so, are you, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, are you doing any online training? Like, are you strictly analog still? Do you watch any videos? Oh, no, do no, you do no, any no. tactics training? Me and trainers? Stockfish are getting to be the best of friends. Uh-oh. Tom Murphy and Stockfish sounds like a dangerous combination. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh my method is always I'll, I'll start at a low setting just to get a feel for the program. And then as I go up, like uh, right now, I play Stockfish at the 2200 setting. And I use that to spot check where I am with my opening understanding. I realize that Stockfish normally is going to take me apart tactically, but at the settings I use, it's usually an even tactical battle. So, that makes it. That keeps me studying. That's cool. I, I myself and I know a lot of other people. We kind of um, we struggle with. I, I just can't. I can't motivate to play a computer, 
And I think a lot of people have trouble with that. A uh, gentleman named Yuri in the Perpetual Chess Facebook group has been a big advocate. Shout out to Yuri. I can't remember his last name right now. But he's he's always saying you got to get someone to talk about practicing against computers. So um, <clears throat> why is it that, like... Why is it that you would choose to play Stockfish rather than just like hopping on chess.com for a blitz game? Okay. Think of it this way. You could play 20 blitz games, and unless you go back and analyze each and every game with a computer, you won't know the truth of the story. However, if you will set the computer at a rating that is not too frustrating, you will get to the tactical truth and you will grow faster. Interesting. And when you play a, a Stockfish 2200 level, what time control do you generally practice at? Uh, no time control. This is straight slow chess. Wow. And how many, like how long would a typical game be? A half hour. Okay. That's reasonable. So, so, so it is my practice to get at least two Stockfish games per day since I've been locked up with COVID. Okay, good stuff. And, and Tom, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Okay, um, general blitz advice, like, um, say, say, again, I was asking uh, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky a few weeks back. Um, I feel like a lot of people are playing more blitz because everyone's stuck at home. So, for anyone who's, yeah. who's trying to improve at blitz, um, how do you separate the two? What what skills are more important in blitz as opposed to slower time controls? Uh, with, with blitz, it is decision-making that is your number one nemesis. So for whoever is studying to, uh, whoever's playing blitz, you have to, first of all, stick to openings that you are presently studying. For example, if you want to play a good blitz game and you're playing a stronger opponent, Start with an opening like the Queen's Gambit, the Ready, the English, something strategic in nature so that your, your tactical decisions are much easier to deal with. What's going to happen is you're going to be more efficient during the course of the game. Because, you, you see, if, if, if you always strive for double-edged positions like a Sicilian or uh, a romantic opening like the uh, Two Knights, you're going to get into major time trouble trying to figure out all the different decision-making trees. If you keep your, your opening system simpler, you'll, you'll move much more efficiently so you don't lose time. That's, that's good advice. And when we used to play, I couldn't crack your French defense. Are you still playing the French, Tom? Oh, no, no, no. I switched to the Carol can. Oh, man, I'd rather play you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the last couple of GMs I played online weren't saying that. Yeah, I mean. They were sorry. <laughs> they were sorry. But, no, I, I, I don't get that many GM games online. So when I do, I, uh, I really do appreciate them. Uh, but one of the nicest GMs I have played online, uh, Pablo Riccardi from Argentina. Really cool guy. He's got his own, uh, he's well-renowned in Argentina. And he was very kind when we discussed our games. Awesome. Always nice to uh, to help share the knowledge, especially um, from Grandmasters. Um, so one more uh, mailbag question, Tom, for you. This one is from a gentleman by the name of uh, Greg Shahadi, who asks, uh, what is your Miss Pac-Man all-time high score? And before you answer, just for the younger listeners, Miss Pac-Man, I don't, you know, I, I feel old even explaining this, but it's a, you know, classic arcade game. Um, that yes, used it to is. Be, used to be, you could find it everywhere. You know, Greg used yes, to play sir. it at this. You know what? There, you, there is still one last Miss Pac-Man machine in Chicago. And last year I set an all-time high for me with 210,000. So you still can tell it. Greg, uh, he still got the record. Okay, yeah, you guys were fierce at it. And Jen was really good, too. Jen Shahadi, also great Miss Pac-Man player. Um, I remember Greg used to play at this place called Little Pete's, um, not too far from Franklin Mercantile. Uh, rest in peace to Little Pete's as well. But um, um, 
do you have any other what hobbies do you have any other hobbies outside of chess now that uh you don't get to play as much miss pac-man tom oh yeah 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 i fell in love with poker oh no say it ain't so <laughs> um, yes it is I, so people, well, here, here's the hit i realized that with my economic situation i had to play limit poker okay so here in illinois actually in indiana they have one casino and one table only. They play three six limit. Okay. And there's about forty of us that line up every Friday and Saturday to play. Yeah, now, I'm sure. For, for limit, so Go for on. limit poker, it only takes a hundred bucks. So yeah. we get and we sit all day and we talk shit and we bet like crazy with garbage because nobody wants to fold. <laughs> I'm surprised you put yourself in that category, being the disciplined game player that you are. I used to be a, a poker pro, by the way, and I played a lot of Limit Hold'em. So um, I'm, I'm surprised. They, but for you, it's more of a, a, a way to relax, it sounds like. Oh, absolutely. Now, 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 when I'm playing for blood, I play backgammon. Okay. Yeah, I never, never got... Um, Never got into backgammon, which is probably uh, for <laughs> probably for the better in terms of um, managing one's time because it seems like a, like an awesome game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me give, relate one quick story. So, uh, a friend of mine here in Chicago, I, I don't think he'll mind a shout out. Paul Baraz is like a professional level backgammon player. He's also a chess player. So we trade. I give him chess lessons. He gives me backgammon lessons. And he took me to my very first backgammon tournament. Now, while I'm at this backgammon tournament, I meet a guy from Detroit who's a 2400 and a professional backgammon player. Now, you know me as the quote unquote hustler. This guy spotted me. He, he knew Paul, but he spotted me. And he picked me as his mark. <laughs> so when he sidled up to play, asked me to play backgammon, I said, I'll tell you what. I'm not much of a backgammon player, but I'll give you odds at chess. Now, mind you, this guy's 2400 and $40 later, he was asking me, how in God's name did you do that? <laughs> then we played backgammon, and he lost anyway. And so this year, I got a chance to go to Detroit to play a cage match, and lo and behold, there he was. And he was like, I didn't forget you. And I looked at it, and it had been like five years between. He says, yeah, you're the hustler that took my money at backgammon and chess. And then I looked, I said, oh, my God. And one of my, and Nathan was there. And Nathan said, you know, this guy's 2400 I said, I didn't know it then. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we got his revenge. So all's well that ends well. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of our earlier conversation about like what constitutes hustling as opposed to just gambling, to me, the gray area is when you just don't tell someone, you know, your rating. It's, it's hustling if you actually play badly on purpose in order to get them to play for money or play for higher stakes. But if you just withhold uh, information... Now that, that's more the Chicago mindset. Is it? Now, Chicago is full of hustlers. Okay. I mean, everyone has to make a living, you know, if you, if you stop now, at the point I, to play... I, don't, I ain't mad at them. Even yeah. the hustlers come to me for private lessons and then go out and go back to hustling. Okay. Um, so, so I Tom, consider myself to facilitate it. Excellent. Do you, do you get a uh, finder's fee? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Good stuff. So, Tom, any other stories you want to tell from all your, your, your many battles over the years um, before we let you go? Uh, I think we've hit most of the key stories. Uh, there was one lawyer that came through DuPont Circle back when I was the guru of DuPont Circle. Now, he knew me. He knew how strong I was, but he had just settled a million-dollar case, and he and I played for the most money I'd ever played for for a single game. And I was like, you know what? You are right with me. And he uh, donated well, we $1,000. Gotta... Wow. Were you nervous? No, I had already played him. I knew what to expect. He knew what to expect, but he had a pocket full of money and he knew me and he enjoyed my personality. 
I can be so, extremely funny when I want to, uh, and we just had a ball. And, uh, you know, now that, um, with, uh, with the statute of limitations having expired, can I, can I ask you, did you have the money if you lost? Hell no. <laughs> I didn't but, think so. No, wait, 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 wait. But what happened was I had already won 500. So I had some capital built up. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And did you just, so how many games did you play at a thousand a pop? Uh, just two. Okay. Well, you know, not a bad day's work. Not a bad day's work at all. Okay. Well, awesome stuff, Tom. So I don't know if anyone's interested in getting, getting lessons from you. I don't know if you want me to, to include, you know, I was, uh, I, I tell you what, just use my phone number. Have them call me. you got, okay. if you got customers, I need them. Okay. So everyone be kind. No, uh, you know, no spam text to Tom, but I'll put it in the show description. Uh, it's thousands of people, Tom. So, um, hopefully no one blows up your phone that, uh, you know, unnecessarily, but, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, if you, if you enjoyed this story, Tom's got many more. Absolutely. All right, Tom, take care. Uh, you too, Ben. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who continue to help spread the word about Perpetual Chess. You can spread the word via word of mouth or positive reviews on podcast platforms. We are up to 98 written reviews on Apple Podcasts, and only one of them aggravates me. Amazing support. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFisher1 or join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. You should also check out the Perpetual Chess Instagram page. But more than anything, I want to express my gratitude to those who provide financial support to the show. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable.com for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page to help sustain and improve the show and while they're at it find out about future guests and send in some great questions so without further ado i'd like to give special thanks to the following people and entities they are chessable.com quality chess books the capital city chess club the abysmal depths of chess blog the apprentice twitch channel andrew alharji Andrew Bach, Andy Ryerson, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Drake Domingue, I am Eric Rosen, Firas Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Harfs, Greg Natal, I am Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Sell, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, LilaAnalysis.com for cloud-based Leela engine analysis, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Peter Sadi, the Play More Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Robert Coucher, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stenix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, Wayne Beam, and I would also like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Andy Ryerson, FM Andre Terakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Cramley, of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dirk Decker, Drake Domingue, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, FM, Donnie Ariel, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Frank Tortoris MD, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Srinivasan, 
Jacob Kovach, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, Jadeep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Horland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, JJ Stranad, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Reiforth, Laura Boyowski, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Arispide, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solom, Neil Bruce, Nigmat, Milad Janov, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalvo, Richard Hollenbach, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, The Say Chess YouTube Channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Shane Unger, Stefan Roller, WGM Tata of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William H. Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Storyanov. Thanks, as always, for listening, and I will catch you all next week. Mm-hmm.